All right, good evening. Welcome to the Mob Museum. Please get settled in. Uh, my name is Jeff Schumacher. I'm the Vice President of Exhibits and Programs. And I want to thank everyone for coming out tonight. It's going to be a, a really interesting subject that we are going to focus on. Our speaker tonight is an authority on organized crime in America. This is exemplified in the many books, magazine articles, blogs, podcasts, and documentaries with which his name is associated. Scott Bernstein has written in great depth about the Chicago outfit and the Philadelphia Mafia, among other uh, interesting topics. But he is best known for writing about crime on, on his home turf of Detroit, Michigan. He is one of the nation's experts on what happened to Jimmy Hoffa. He's spoken about that here at the museum in the past. Uh, he's also an expert on the Detroit teenage king, drug kingpin, White Boy Rick, uh, who doubled as an FBI informant. Uh, he's also spoken about that here at our Mob Museum. Uh, he's also a member of our advisory council here. We're very proud of that. Uh, tonight, Scott is going to tell us the story of the Black Mafia family, a drug dealing network that started in Detroit, uh, but eventually expanded, in, expanded into one of the largest drug trafficking organizations in the country. With some of Scott's guidance, the STARS cable network has launched a dramatic series inspired by the Black, Ma Black Mafia family. If you haven't seen it yet, I suspect you will seek it out after hearing Scott talk tonight. Uh, please join me in welcoming Scott Bernstein. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you for uh, coming out to uh, my talk. I am very excited about uh, telling you the story of the Black Mafia family. Uh, it's a story that has been told definitely um, over the last decade and a half since their uh, downfall in 2005. It's a story that's been told quite a bit, but not in the way that I'm gonna tell it to you. So uh, it's a story that's been really told from kind of one angle that focuses on their bust and the fact that they had a presence in Atlanta, but the whole scope uh, of, of their organization um, has never really been uh, fleshed out, and I'm gonna add context and provide you uh, insight into the, really this, this epic, epic story that is incredibly uh, Shakespearean in, uh, in content between the two brothers and what they built and then how it all fell apart. And frankly, uh, a lot of the residual, um, a lot of the residuals that have come from the bust are, are still very prevalent today and, and there's a lot of bad blood that's still boiling 15 years later, uh, specifically in relation to the two Flannery brothers. So I'm going to start. So this is uh, uh, the, uh, Terry and Demetrius. Um, the, the picture you just saw was, ter oh, was, was Demetrius, but it wasn't Terry. There was just a miscommunication. The, the, yeah, it was Wolf Jones, who plays a, uh, plays a role in this story, and we'll learn about him more as we go on. But that's uh, Demetrius meets Flannery and, and Terry Southwest T. Flannery uh, in the heyday. And I call it the epic rise and fall of uh, Big Meat Southwest T. and the Black Mafia family. Just a little bit of an um, expansion on, on what the, you know, on, on what the uh, museum labeled it. So I, I, I broke this talk into uh, six different sections. The first section is just the setup to kind of uh, give you a primer and lay the groundwork. So Black Mafia Family was the biggest domestic narcotics trafficking organization in U.S. history. It controlled close to 75% of the American wholesale cocaine market in the early 2000s, which is just really blows the mind if, if you think about uh, the ability to take over uh, that large of a swath of the, uh, uh, the American drug market. And uh, they did it without violence, which is even more amazing. Uh, the organization known on the streets as BMF was uh, started in Detroit in the late 1980s by siblings Demetrius Big Meech Flannery and, and Terry Southwest T. Flannery and really redefined what a corporate-style drug gang looked like, acted, and could grow to be. Um, Demetrius and, and Terry had big dreams and big visions and really thought macro as opposed to micro, and those ambitions turned into a criminal empire the likes of which the DEA had never seen. 
Um, by the end of the 1990s, the group had expanded exponentially across the country, planting flags in 24 different states. In essence, BMF became the Walgreens of street cocaine sales in almost every major American city uh, from about 1998 until their uh, eventual arrest in the fall of 2005. So that's the setup, and now we'll get into the story. Well, actually, there's more setup here. <laughs> Uh, Big Meat's takeover the, of the national drug trade was accomplished by expert diplomacy rather than violence and intimidation, which also makes him a, a true outlier and a unicorn. Uh, at the time of their federal bus in 2005, Big Meat, Southwest T, and their BMF crew had already achieved genuine icon status in both the underworld and hip-hop culture. Um, just between 2010 and 2020, uh, BMF as a group Big Meech and Southwest T were shouted out in 150 of the top 200 rap songs on the uh, Billboard Top 500. So it shows you how ubiquitous they became in hip-hop culture, where every rapper uh, from Young Jeezy to Jay-Z to Drake uh, are referencing them in their songs even today. Uh, last month, Stars and 50 Cent's G-Unit Productions premiered the Black Mafia Family scripted television show starring Meech's son, Little Meech, as his father, Snoop Dogg, and Eminem. And the premiere was so uh, successful, the ratings were so high, that after one episode uh, on September 26th, when the show premiered, it's already been renewed for a second season. And now we will tell you the story. <laughs> so Charles and Lu uh, Lucille Flannery, the Flannery brothers' uh, parents, they married in Cleveland in 1965 and then moved uh, with their one-year-old son, Demetrius, to Detroit in 1969, settling in the southwest part of the city near, Ford, the, near the Ford Motor Company's famous Rouge plant. Now, in Detroit, uh, we had you know, mass migrations uh, starting in the 1930s and 40s, coming up from down south uh, to Detroit for auto factory jobs. And unfortunately for the Flannery family, they were really kind of the last group of people uh, in the 60s and 70s that were coming in uh, to Detroit to get factory jobs. And again, unfortunately for them, the ship had kind of already sailed on the, uh, the glory years of, of the, the automotive industry in America. A lot of the work was being outsourced uh, to Asia and to Europe, and a lot of those factory jobs were drying up. Um, in 1967, Detroit had uh, one of the biggest riots in American history in the summer of 1967, and the city started to empty out almost immediately. Between 1967 and 1970, uh, the city lost 25% of its population. Uh, at its peak in, in 1965, Detroit had 2 million people. Um, we are still recovering, frankly, the city of Detroit is still recovering from the 1967 riots 50 years later, and uh, we're still feeling some of those effects. Our population now is well under half a million. So it, you went from a, one of the top five cities in population uh, in America to now you're in the top 20. Uh, Charles is a struggling musician, goes to work at the Rouge plant, uh, playing his trumpet at area jazz clubs at nights and on weekends while Lucille gives birth to another boy, Terry, in 1970, and teaches Sunday school at the local church. Uh, the two brothers are a study in contrast, uh, not just their looks. Meech is light-skinned and uh, more slender. Uh, Terry is dark-skinned and thicker. But more than just their uh, appearances, their personalities are completely different and really complemented each other in building uh, the Black Mafia family. Um, you know, Meech is outgoing, fun-loving, a natural leader, uh, you know, a, a gangland politician from, from the very start, while Terry is, he's more laid back, deliberate, understated, quieter, uh, and was someone that was more comfortable and thrived kind of behind the scenes. Uh, so this is a picture of uh, Charles Flannery on the left and then Lucille on the right. Uh, when Lucille was a, a younger mother, it's her in the middle, and then that's Lucille now. Uh, Charles and Lucille uh, face financial strain in the 1980s, and Charles loses his job at the Rouge plant. Uh, his womanizing begins to take its toll on the marriage, and they separate. Uh, meanwhile, they're having trouble paying the rent and keeping the, the electricity on. Um, 
with the family fighting to pay the rent in the city of Detroit, awash in cocaine, ravaged by the crack epidemic. Meech and Terry start skipping their ninth grade classes at Detroit Southwestern High School and running with a small downriver drug crew known as the 50 Boys, led by Edric E.D. Boyd. So in Detroit, the downriver area is split kind of in half, and it's all south of downtown. Um, you have what I would call white downriver, uh, which is cities like Wyandotte, Allen Park, Woodhaven, Brownstown, Township, places place like that. And then you have Black Downriver, uh, which uh, River Rouge, Inkster, Ecorse, Taylor. And those were the areas where a lot of the black families uh, that were coming up from the South in the, in the 40s and 50s, um, because the Rouge plant, which was the biggest of all the Ford plants, it was like a city within a city, uh, a lot of those families that were coming out from Alabama, Mississippi, Tennessee, uh, settled in those downriver, uh, kind of this, these, these cluster of smoggy factory towns. And uh, that's, where, that's where the Flannerys grew up. And uh, they started running with a small drug crew known as the 50 Boys. E.D. Boyd was a, you know, a small time drug boss uh, that ran a couple corners in, in southwest Detroit in that, in that downriver area. And they called themselves the 50 Boys because they sold cheap uh, $50 bags of cocaine where you would have to pay uh, 150 200 bucks in other parts of the city, but you could come down to southwest Detroit off Etzel Street and you could get a $50 bag uh, at a discount from the 50 Boys. Uh, 50 Boys are a retail drug crew. That's the lowest rung on the narcotics food chain, meaning that they're buying from wholesalers, uh, you know, it, it'd be like, you know, retailing at, at, a, at a grocery store, at a drug store, as opposed to, you know, supplying the grocery store or drug store. Uh, soon, Terry and Meech usurp Charles as the family's made, uh, main breadwinners, and they begin paying the rent for their mom and buying cars and clothes and uh, starting to kind of flaunt the lifestyle that they, that they begin leading. So the second part of this, this talk is called The Rise. In around 1988, Meech and Terry leave the 50 Boys and start out on their own to tackle the wholesale drug game, putting the retail game in their rearview mirrors. They knew that if they wanted to become kingpins, if they wanted to uh, build the empire that they had envisioned, um, they, had to start, they had to start climbing the ladder, going up the food chain in the underworld and graduating from small-time retail drug dealing to wholesale drug dealing, meaning that you're buying you know, massive amounts of kilos at one time, breaking them down, and then distributing them to street dealers to give them to the customers. Uh, over the next two years, they were going to start their own drug organization, the seeds of which would eventually blossom into BMF. They weren't calling themselves BMF until the 1990s, but the organization that uh, began around 1988 would turn into the Black Mafia family. Uh, first, they hook up with Rodolfo Bolo Moreno, who, uh, there's another part of Southwest Detroit that is mainly Hispanic. It's really the only part of Detroit and really Michigan that has a huge concentrated population of Hispanics and Latinos. Uh, we don't have a lot of them in, in Detroit. They're all kind of, uh, again, kind of clustered in the southwest part of the city. And Bolo, uh, in the late 80s, became the, the most uh, prominent of the Hispanic drug lords in, in that neighborhood. And he welcomes the Flannerys into his organization and begins teaching them the wholesale drug game um, and, and feeding them bricks of cocaine to sell. Uh, bricks of cocaine to sell, and start their uh, ascent in, in the, uh, it, 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 to the criminal empire that they would eventually build. Um, after working with Bolo for about a year and a half, they find themselves a better deal. More wholesale drugs fed to them at a more consistent and at cheaper prices through an African-American uh, weight man, meaning a wholesale drug dealer by the name of Harold H. Town Mills, uh, sometimes referred to as Halloween Harold. Uh, it's a bit of a character, um, and he was really the, that was, they, they learned the game from E.D. And, and Bolo, and then their relationship with H-Town kind of took them to another level, uh, some of it having to do with H-Town going to prison and uh, having uh, a void left to be filled by the Flannery Brothers, but we'll get to that in a second. 
So I know these pictures aren't great. On the left is a picture of E.D. Boyd. It's kind of blurry. Uh, but on the right is, uh, an, uh, you know, Big Meech and Terry in the early years of BMF, both wearing chains. I think this is about 1989 with uh, two of their uh, uh, lieutenants. So, uh, and then this is where we get our first conflict. Uh, legendary Southwest Detroit drug lord Leighton the Beast Simon returns from prison and declares war on the Flannery brothers for encroaching on his turf. Leighton Simon was kind of a urban legend in Southwest Detroit. He had come up in the 1970s as an enforcer for uh, a guy by the name of Walter the Black Fox Quezon. Walter Quezon was the African-American godfather of the River Rouge area, the downriver um, southwest Detroit area, and ruled that, that, that area's drug game in the 70s and early 80s, and Leighton was his muscle. Uh, they all went to prison in around 1982 or 83, and uh, Leighton came out in 1988 and declared the territory that Demetrius and Terry had planted a flag in as his rightful territory because he had been in charge of it through Walter Quezon uh, in the years before he went to prison. If anybody is watching Black Mafia Family Show right now on the Stars Network, Leighton Simon's character has been renamed Lamar Silas and is the main um, antagonist in the first season of the show. Uh, it's been kind of a breakout star uh, on the show, kind of in a similar way to the, the show The Wire, the way the Omar character was a big breakout. Uh, the Lamar Silas character has been a big breakout this first month of the show, and his uh, real-life counterpart was Leighton Simon. So the war starts off, Terry is shot, uh, loses his right eye, and if you've seen pictures of Terry... At any time in the last 30 years, he has a lazy left eye where he lost his eye. I'll show you a picture of it in a second. Um, then in Memorial Day 1988, uh, Leighton and his brother Elvis are eating dinner at a, a, a local Coney Island. If you're not from Detroit, you probably don't know that term. But in Michigan, uh, we call diners Coney Islands. Not exactly sure why, but... I've, I learned quickly when I left Detroit in my teen years, and I'd ask people, well, can you show me where Coney Island? And they would be like, New York? <laughs> like, uh, but uh, so it was a, a place that was actually called Detroit Coney Island, and it's in southwest Detroit. It's actually still there today. Um, and it, some people say the Flannery Brothers. Other people aren't sure. But uh, a number of people bust into the... Coney Island and spray the booth that Terry, and, or sorry, spray the booth that Leighton and Elvis are sitting in with gunfire. Um, Elvis dies immediately. Leighton is holding Elvis in his arms as his little brother dies, and then someone comes up behind Leighton and shoots him five times. Um, nobody's ever been arrested for any of this stuff. Uh, rumors were that. Uh, the Valentine brothers might have been behind the hit on Elvis. The Valentine brothers were two of uh, the Flannery brothers' top lieutenants. And uh, then Meech is almost killed. On the year anniversary of Leighton's brother's murder, he shot 17 times uh, by, uh, with automatic weapon fire, um, but survives it. But at this point, he realizes he has to leave town because he's either going to be arrested or he's going to end up dead. So he bolts, um, and around uh, when 89 is turning to 90, he leaves town. The future of the brothers and their burgeoning drug empire appears to be in peril. This is a picture of Terry Flannery. Not the greatest picture, but if you can kind of see on the, uh, his left, or his right eye, but as we're looking at it, it's on his left, uh, is a bit droopy and lazy based on that uh, uh, shooting that, that he survived back in 1988. So now we're at kind of the, the pinnacle. Uh, the eye, or well, I'm going to tell you how they got to the pinnacle. Uh, the odds are stacked against him. Meaches uses his time away from Detroit in the first half of the 90s to network his, way, network his way across the country, planting seeds for his takeover of the nation's dope game and declaring his new organization the Black Mafia Family. And this is when Meach decided that 
him and Terry's desire to control the Southwest Detroit drug game was they were thinking too small and that, that they had to uh, kind of retrofit their ambitions and instead of thinking about taking over one small part of one city, they said, well, what if we take that same blueprint that we drew up for this and apply it to the whole country? Uh, which, again, seems impossible, but uh, Demetrius made it a reality. Uh, led by Terry, who's holding down the home front for his absentee brother in Detroit, BMF grabs Harold Mills's business with, or when Mills is in prison in 1993. So that was really the first step in them establishing their empire, because now uh, he has a direct source for drugs that he has no middle, there's no middlemen anymore. First, he's getting his drugs from ED, or they are getting their drugs from ED. Then they're getting their drugs from Bolo. By the 90s, they're getting their drugs from Harold Mills, but there's still, they're, they're still uh, buffers. When Harold Mills goes to prison, all those buffers are eliminated, and uh, they take over that entire supply source. And Terry uh, takes Harold's wife, uh, Tony, who goes on to become the first lady of BMF over the next 10 years. She was not just uh, a girlfriend or a wife. She became a lieutenant and was actually calling shots for them. Uh, and that relationship um, did not sit well with Demetrius and was kind of one of the first uh, shoes to drop in what would eventually become a, a major strain in the relationship between the two brothers. But it kind of started with Tony coming on the scene. There was a little bit of a Yoko Ono effect here where uh, Tony was taking up a lot of the oxygen in the room. And in Demetrius' mind, maybe overstepping her boundaries, Terry was very um, protective of Tony and trusted her immensely and wanted to include her in business decisions. Uh, so there was some friction that started to develop at that point. Uh, Meech and Terry go to L.A., and they hook up with a guy by the name of Wayne, the maniac, maniac joiner. He becomes BMF's supply line to the Mexican drug cartels, specifically El Chapo Sinaloa Group and American cartel boss La Barbie on the Texas border. I don't know how familiar all of you are with uh, the cartel figures, but you know it, it doesn't get any bigger than El Chapo. Uh, the world's biggest drug dealer up until his arrest a couple years ago. He's now doing life in prison uh, in the Supermax in Colorado after avoiding uh, arrest for some 20 years, escaping from prisons in uh, holes dug underneath the prison and uh, motorcycles smuggled in for him to drive through those holes and uh, just real craziness, stuff that, you know, straight out of a movie. Uh, and then El Barbie was the... Mexican cartels kind of man on the ground in Texas who also had a big role in Mexico because he married one of the cartel uh, boss's daughters. But uh, La Barbie was an actual American. His name was Edward Villarreal and uh, grew up in Texas, was a, a football star in Texas and uh, lived in an area that was you know, within shouting distance of the Mexican border. Uh, eventually became a minor uh, marijuana distributor, and then through his relationship with his wife, uh, got involved in the cartel world and, and became one of the bigger cartel bosses uh, in the 2000s and, and 2010s. But he was an American. And uh, Demetrius and Terry were dealing directly with El Chapo and La Barbie. So it shows you how big they're getting. And with those supply connections, you know, it's like turning on a faucet. Uh, more drugs than you could ever dream of. And then that gives Demetrius an opportunity to backtrack uh, and go back to all of the cities that he had kind of gone on that initial campaign in 90, 91, 92, 93, selling his vision to all of uh, the, you know, all the, the states and the city's respective drug bosses um, he then goes back a couple of years later and says, you remember that idea I came to you with three or four years ago? Well, now I have the resources to, to put it into action. 
and uh, just, again, master diplomacy on, on Demetrius's part. So this is a picture of Terry and Tony, uh, circa 2000. So that's Tony Welch, who was Harold Mills' wife and then became the first lady of BMF. This is a picture of Demetrius at the height of his power, um, wearing a BMF chain and a uh, watch that looks like it cost about a million dollars. Uh, and to his right is uh, Chad J. Bo Brown, who was his underboss. Um, and I'll get into this in a second. Demetrius built black mafia family in the mold of the American mafia. He studied the American mafia and really became obsessed with Meyer Lansky and, and Lucky Luciano and wanting to um, build a similar enterprise for African Americans in the same way that the Italians had built this national network of mafia families, which at its peak had 26 different families around the country. Demetrius uh, envisioned doing the same thing, um, and he did it. They had 24 uh, different outlets as opposed to 26, but kind of the same thing. Uh, in 1996, Mitch, Meech goes on another coast-to-coast -coast di uh, diplomacy campaign and successfully establishes BMF outlets in nearly half of the 50 states, with hubs being set up in Detroit, Atlanta, LA, New York, St. Louis, Louisville, Memphis, and Dallas. So they were all um, strategically placed to cover uh, territory in all those parts of the country, and the, the hub... The, the nerve center of the operation was still in Detroit. All of the drugs were making their way to Detroit first, where they were uh, cut, processed, packaged, and then distributed around the country. Uh, but Demetrius himself established residence in Atlanta uh, in the late 90s. And I don't have this in the... Uh, well, I'll, I'll get to this in a second. Because Meech views himself as a statement, a modern a statesman, a modern-day Meyer Lansky or Lucky Luciano, Lucky Luciano, and accomplishes his takeover of the American Coke trade without a single ounce of bloodshed, he's immediately revered and beloved in the underworld and hip-hop circles nationwide. BMF's smuggling wing is renowned for its complex system of couriers and vehicles with secret compartments crisscrossing the country simultaneously. There should actually be another uh, closed... Uh, Parentheses, but that's my, my mistake. Uh, Meech and Terry attract a social crowd filled with celebrities, actors, actresses, and rappers. Uh, and BMF, some 300 strong at this point, ringing the 2000s with a giant New Year's Eve party in Manhattan. Um, I just want to uh, backtrack one second and talk about Demetrius arriving in Atlanta. And this goes uh, counter to the um, anti-violence uh, mandate. But again, I, I would... I would Categorized Demetrius as a relatively nonviolent criminal, but in that world, there's always going to be pieces of violence that uh, arise that are just inevitable, necessary evils and whatnot. And uh, Demetrius was tied to, or is allegedly uh, tied by the DEA to a murder in Atlanta in 1997 that tie into the Valentine brothers who I just told you about. And I'll give you a quick synopsis. So uh, Demetrius is coming into Atlanta and the first group of Detroiters that had come to Atlanta back in the 80s and established Detroit's first um, you know, franchise, I guess, in, in Atlanta was a group known as the, the Kingsley Walker crew, led by a guy by the name of Dennis the Duke Kingsley Walker, and he had uh, left Detroit in around 1985 and had come out to Atlanta and made a pretty big splash right away. Uh, they started, uh, the, the Kingsley Walker crew started uh, making business deals with uh, sports celebrities in Atlanta. They made deals uh, with um, uh, Dominique Wilkins and Deion Sanders and Andre Risen. Now, Risen, Sanders, and... Um, Dominique Wilkins weren't doing anything illegal. They were simply uh, opening, our, the Kingsley Walker group would open um, clubs, restaurants, bars, and sign like licensing agreements with Deion Sanders and Dominique Wilkins for them to put their, their name and their likeness and their, their, all their memorabilia in, in, those, um, in those bars and restaurants. But 
Kingsley Walker eventually gets caught and decides to turn on his whole organization. And part of his organization at that time are the Valentine brothers, who I mentioned had, were suspects in the Elvis um, Simon murder. So the Valentine brothers had to go to prison for 15 years based on the Duke, Dennis Kingsley Walker's testimony. The Duke ended up only having to do two years. Um, he gets out of prison on Halloween uh, 1997, almost up on here, up, uh, almost on the uh, 24 year anniversary of that. And he goes, he goes to a party uh, on Peachtree Street at the uh, Hilton, a kind of a welcome home party. And as he's leaving to go check back into the halfway house for the night, uh, he's killed in a drive-by shooting. And there were FBI and DEA informants that told the federal government that the shooter was a man by the name of Big Meech. Now, uh, Demetrius has never been charged with that murder. And there are a lot of people that look at that particular homicide as Demetrius's or I should say the city of Atlanta's introduction to Demetrius, that he kind of came on the scene and eliminated the previous Detroit drug lord that had been in Atlanta, and now he was the new Detroit drug lord that was in Atlanta. So it definitely did not uh, get past the members of the underworld in uh, Atlanta, nor did it get past members of law enforcement. Specifically, a guy by the name of Jack Harvey uh, who would eventually become uh, the leader of the task force that would bring them down. They take a lot of the money that they made in the 90s and early 2000s and they invest in rap music labels. Uh, FBI and DA informants tell the government that both Bad Boy Records and Murder, Inc. Entertainment uh, are partially funded by Black Mafia family proceeds. Uh, Bad Boy Records was Puffy Combs and Biggie Smalls, uh, Mace um, and, and that crew. And then Murder, Inc. Uh, is the Irv Gotti group uh, with uh, Ja Rule and Ashanti. And uh, they were really big for a second in the late 90s, early 2000s. Bad Boy Records helped uh, redefine the whole hip-hop genre in the 1990s. Um, Meet romances actresses like Vivica Fox and Megan Good. Having reached the top of the mountain, the drug game Meech feels inspired to celebrate and promote his BMF brand by putting up highway billboards along the I-75 corridor going directly from Detroit to Atlanta. Two dozen in total bearing the script, the world is BMFs in Scarface movie themed letters. This represents the turning point uh, where he is no longer um, well, this, this, this officially makes him public enemy number one for the federal government. And one of these billboards is behind the DEA, DEA, DEA office in Atlanta, and the other is positioned in the sight line of the FBI and DEA offices in Detroit. Um, this is a picture of Vivica Fox on the left and Megan Good on the right. Um, Megan Good's probably the... the the lesser known of the two. If anybody saw the uh, Anchorman, sequel to Anchorman with, with, with uh, uh, Will Ferrell, she was the, the female lead. And then Vivica Fox has been around for quite, for quite a while. And then this is one of the uh, billboards. I, I'm sorry, it's a little blurry. It came from the History Channel. Um, so I want to just comment really quickly, and I, I mentioned this to some people before the talk, that, and I, I've talked to Demetrius about this. I'm, I've been in contact with Demetrius uh, for the last four years, and we've done a lot of kind of soul searching in discussing where he went wrong. And uh, I'm sure he, if he was here, he would tell you this, that um, for 10 years, let's just say from uh, 1990 to, to 2000, um, Demetrius was very under the radar. Even that uh, 1997 murder, the people in Atlanta didn't even, they, they were getting information that some guy named Big Meech had pulled the trigger uh, in this hit, but they didn't really know who Big Meech was. He was doing all of this politicking and all of this building of his empire, and he was doing it under the radar. He was staying off of, of phones. He wasn't 
uh, in anywhere, uh, he was never in any real close proximity to the drugs that he was selling. He wasn't talking about his operation on, or, uh, on the phone and was able to keep a real low profile. And at some point in the early 2000s, he was the biggest drug dealer in America and it started to eat at him that nobody knew that. And he wanted to tell the world that he was the biggest drug dealer in America and that he had built this empire that just really just flew in the face of anything that anyone thought was possible. And he, he kind of said, well, it's like, you know, the, the old uh, axiom, you know, if a tree falls in the woods and nobody's there to hear or see the tree fall, did it actually fall? So Demetrius is like, I'm the biggest drug dealer in America, but if nobody knows about it, does that really mean anything? So he made the critical decision to let everyone know about it, and that was really the beginning of the end for him. And again, the beginning of the end for his relationship with his brother, uh, his behavior in the early 2000s, the putting up of the billboards, the getting on magazine covers, holding these lavish parties that would cost half a million, a million dollars for one night at a club. Uh, he had a famous party called Meet to the Jungle where he rented out a zoo and paid a zoo a half a million dollars to transport lions, tigers, and bears to a nightclub in Atlanta because um, he's, in addition to being obsessed with Meyer Lansky and Lucky Luciano, he's a big fan of the movie Scarface and uh, liked uh, the scene in Scarface where Tony Montana builds himself his own zoo in, in the backyard of his mansion. So he wanted to throw himself a party and kind of celebrate that. And this just really upset Terry. And Terry was constantly having to troubleshoot for Demetrius and uh, pick up a lot of the, the mess that Demetrius would leave with his, uh, with his behavior. And the wiretaps that were active at this time were picking all of this up. Uh, as, as cautious as Demetrius was talking on the phone is as loose-lipped as Terry was. Um, Terry was sharing all of his complaints with anybody that would listen, including uh, the FBI and DEA. And then it all um, starts to unravel. In 2003, the DEA opens up a, a sprawling investigation titled Motor City Mafia in the wake of the billboards and a three-day-long party for Meech's 35th birthday in Atlanta hosted by uh, Puff Daddy and Nelly. And it was really those two things. The billboards started to come, and you had DEA and FBI agents being like, what, is, what does this mean? Because, again, they weren't sure what BMF was. You had Jack Harvey, the one DEA agent in Atlanta that was sitting there trying to sound all these alarms uh, from 1997 when he first became hip to what Demetrius was doing based on that alleged um, homicide. Uh, he had been sounding alarms for five years. Nobody was paying attention. Then uh, he, he convinces the DEA to do a surveillance at this birthday party, which takes place in July of uh, 03. And it starts off at uh, Puffy Combs' uh, restaurant in, in Atlanta called uh, Justin's, which was a very popular place at that time. And the FBI and DA show up thinking that they're gonna do a night, and, you know, a couple hours worth of surveillance on this party. And then all of a sudden, all of these celebrities start to show up. Denzel Washington was allegedly there. Um, fabulous, Nelly, Puffy, you know, they're, they're hosting it. LL Cool J, um, Ja Rule, Vin Diesel. Um, everyone's showing up at this party and the DEA and FBI agents are like, what, what is this? Then they decide to leave Justin's and they go to one of the BMF estates. They had bought a number of pieces of property around the country where they would, uh, they would use as party houses, they would use as stash houses, sometimes they would use as residents. And they show up at one of these estates in Atlanta, and this is on a Friday night, and nobody left until Sunday morning. And the, the DA and FBI are just astounded at what they're seeing. And on Monday, 
morning at the, at the weekly DNA, DEA briefing, the decision is made to open up Operation Motor City Mafia, just based on the billboards and that 35th birthday party that Demetrius had. Um, and then over the next year, the floodgates just open, and there are just dozens of raids and seizures, um, people being uh, delivered letters, letting them know that their phones have been tapped, uh, and it, it, there was a lot of confusion and finger pointing and people wondering, like, how is this thing all slipping away from us? Uh, and then in September of 03, another big domino drops. Uh, the, CF, the CFO of um, the Black Mafia family, a guy by the name of William Doc Marshall, handles all of the financials. Uh, he was a college-educated accounting major that was a, a, a real whiz kid with numbers and was able to hide all of BMF's money and uh, was the only person that really dealt with both Demetrius' side of the Black Mafia family and Terry's side of the Black Mafia family. So it was really the only person that could connect the two. Demetrius, again, in the vein of Meyer Lansky and Lucky Luciano, he wanted it so the right hand didn't know what the left hand was doing, the left hand didn't know what the right hand was doing. So um, Doc Marshall, though, knew what both hands were doing. And uh, he kills an intruder in an attempted home invasion robbery that takes place in his uh, posh mid midtown Atlanta residence, September 03. He gets off on self-defense, but he can't account for the $450,000 that the FBI and DEA find in the safe when they show up. Uh, and there's a, a dead body on the floor, and there's $450,000 in cash. Um, he's being put under the microscope. And Doc Marshall was not a gangster. Um, he was a criminal, and he was someone that uh, was not a tough guy. He was a money guy, uh, was you know, always dressed very preppy, wasn't someone that wore jerseys or oversized T-shirts or, or, um, or, or you know, starter caps or whatnot. Um, he looked like he was straight out of a, a Polo Ralph Lauren catalog. So the FBI and DEA immediately view him as a weak link. Um, and they start planting seeds with him in 2003 saying, you might not be arrested right now, but at some point you're going to have to account for where that $450,000 came from. And if you can't, you're going to prison. And Doc Marshall was someone that did not want to go to prison. He wasn't someone that probably uh, would have done very well in prison because he wasn't a hardcore criminal or gangster. And that will, again, we'll, we'll see how that plays out in the coming minutes. Uh, that's a picture of Doc Marshall. Um, uh, okay, so this is really the end of the relationship between uh, Terry and Demetrius, and it actually happened right here in Las Vegas. Uh, Terry was celebrating his 34th, 34th birthday in January or February, I'm not sure, of 2004. Uh, they rented out a huge uh, banquet hall at Caesars Palace, and uh, both Terry's crew and Meech's crew and all the other BMF crews from around the country came in and uh, were, partying, were partying. Demetrius uh, did not show up, which... Um, didn't sit well with some people. And then Demetrius satellite, uh, did a, a satellite phone call. This was before FaceTime, um, but was you know, uh, zoomed in to the, to the festivities and gave a speech uh, from Atlanta. And Terry didn't love it. He thought he was taking some of the spotlight away from him. This is, wait, this is my party, and now we got to listen to my brother go on for an hour about uh, how great our, our, you know, his organization is, when in fact it's actually my organization too. Um, and things got so bad at that event that the two crews actually pulled weapons on each other um, in the parking lot and then retreated to their respective hotels and there was some belief for a couple hours there that a war was about to break out. Um, not a lot of people know about this, 
But uh, this definitely happened, and uh, guns were drawn, but uh, no, uh, no weapons were fired. But it officially ended the relationship between Terry and Demetrius. They stopped speaking at that point, and for the most part, they have not spoken since. Um, Terry rebranded his wing of Black Mafia family, the 263 crew. Um, right now, Terry is actually uh, selling legal cannabis under the 263 brand. Um, two nightclub murders tied to BMF in Atlanta also raised their profile in the public eye and their priority status in Washington at the Department of Justice. The first is the club chaos killing of Wolf Jones and uh, Wolf Jones' uh, bodyguard, Riz Gertie. Wolf Jones was actually the first picture you saw today when you walked in here. There was a picture of Demetrius and then someone who kind of looks like Terry, but is actually Anthony Wolf Jones, who was not uh, a stranger to headlines. He was Puffy Combs' longtime bodyguard and um, was someone that was in the headlines in 1999 when Puffy and J-Lo when, he, when, when Puff Daddy was dating Jennifer Lopez, if anybody remembers this, they got arrested after a nightclub shooting, um, and Puffy actually had to go on trial for it. Uh, one of his protégés at the time, a rapper by the name of Shine, had to go to prison for it. Uh, J-Lo ended up breaking up with Puffy because of this situation. She felt that it was very bad for her career at that time. And Wolf Jones was with them, and actually, I believe, also took a case from that... Um, from that incident because they pulled over uh, the car that they were all traveling and Wolf was driving, coming out of the club shooting and they found a gun uh, on Wolf. So uh, Demetrius and Wolf knew each other. In fact, they were friendly. But uh, in 2004, they're at a club called Club Chaos in Atlanta and they got into an altercation in the VIP lounge uh, over a girl, uh, Wolf Jones, uh, was, I guess, in the process of breaking up with his girlfriend, um, was trying to talk to her at the club. The girlfriend did not want to talk to Wolf Jones. The girlfriend was with uh, a number of the BMF people. She went to the BMF people and said, hey, can you get Wolf Jones away from me? Demetrius, I guess, knew the woman and uh, stepped up to Wolf Jones and told him to leave. Wolf didn't take very kindly to this. Uh, they were eventually ejected from the club, Wolf and his, uh, his bodyguard, Riz, but uh, they were clearly still looking for trouble because when Demetrius and Demetrius' bodyguard, a guy by the name of uh, Bull, uh, when, when, when Big Meech and Bull come out of the club when the club shuts down and they're walking to their car in the parking lot, uh, Wolf and Riz are there and they start shooting at them. Uh, Demetrius and Bull return fire and both Wolf and Riz are killed, but uh, Demetrius and Bull are, are let off on self-defense. But nonetheless, this is just raising the profile. They're getting into the headlines. It's, it's drawing more anger and frustration from the DEA and, and the FBI. And then probably the straw that breaks the camel's back is this Velvet Room shooting a couple months later of a guy by the name of Prince Drummond, who wasn't, from what I understand, was not a gangland figure at all. But uh, the BMF crew was out partying in Atlanta. Um, the third in command of BMF was a guy by the name of Fleming Daniels, who went by the nickname Ill. Uh, also, they called him Joe Pesci. He was a, a smaller guy that had a very, very big temper. Um, they called him Joe Pesci because of the, mo the movies Casino and Goodfellas, where the Joe Pesci character can can flip his lid. So Ill Daniels had, had gotten that nickname and it was on full display that night in 2004. They're leaving a club. Well, uh, sorry, uh, Ill gets into his Porsche and is backing out and Prince Drummond was, I guess, almost hit by the Porsche and Prince Drummond kind of smacks the Porsche with his hand saying, hey dude, you almost ran me over. And Ill Daniels is, it feels disrespected by this and gets out of the car and in front of a whole parking lot of people, executes Prince Drummond, like in cold blood, puts him on the ground and puts two in the back of his head. Uh, and this, at this point, the, um, the notion that they were a nonviolent group kind of goes out the window. Uh, but there's some nuance to that. They were nonviolent in the operation 
of their organization. There were no murders tied to any territory disputes or internal dissension. Um, the violence that was occurring was all kind of ancillary club violence that was happening when people were either liquored up or, uh, or high on drugs and not thinking straight. Doesn't make it any better, but I, I just want to clarify that. Uh, so that's a picture of Puffy, and that's Wolf Jones on his right. Um, Wolf Jones, I, I'll digress for a quick second. Um, anybody that's a, you know, a fan of hip-hop or rap, they know about the East Coast, West Coast rap war. That was a real thing. It wasn't made up by the, the media. The, you had probably a dozen murders that occurred between 1994 and uh, 2002 tied to... Uh, brewing tensions between Bad Boy Records in New York and uh, Death Row Records in LA. Uh, a lot of people point to Wolf Jones as the start of the entire East Coast, West Coast rap war because Wolf Jones murdered Suge Knight's bodyguard and best friend, a guy by the name of Jake Robles, uh, known as the Violator or Big Jake, in a, uh, a nightclub shooting in 1994. And that was really the first time bad blood had er erupted between Puffy and Suge Knight, which would then erupt even further as the years go on. But Wolf Jones was the one that pulled the trigger in the uh, Jake Robles murder, which a lot of people uh, cite as the kickoff of the East Coast, West Coast rap war. The dominoes in Operation Motor City Mafia began to fall one by one. In, 2000, in May 2005, a shootout erupts at the arrest of the BMF St. Louis crew between a enforcement unit that BMF called Sin City and DEA agents in affluent suburban Atlanta neighborhood. In June of 05, the first BMF lieutenant to jump ship uh, to the government is Omari Odog Hayes, um, the first member of the inner circle to turn. And then in July of 05, Terry is pulled over on his way to a St. Louis video shoot uh, for young Jeezy, where he has $5 million in jewelry that he can't account for. So um, all the nails in the coffin are... are uh, are piling up here. And then in October of 05, the historic Operation Motor City Mafia finally lands and snares a total of 175 BMF bosses, crew leaders, soldiers, and associates, confiscate more than $300 million from bank accounts. Um, Meech is taken into custody in Dallas, Terry uh, in St. Louis. It's the biggest bust uh, in the hallowed annals of the DA's fight on organized drug trafficking. Um, I want to just clarify what that means. It's not the biggest, uh, it's not the biggest bust in DA history, but it's the biggest domestic bust in DA history, meaning that all of the activity was stemming from America. There were bigger busts tied to international cartels and whatnot doing business in America. But in terms of a domestic organization, uh, the, the BMF bus was the biggest in DA history. Final nail in BMF's coffin is hammered home in March of 06 when Doc Marshall finally decides that uh, he doesn't want to go to prison and he signs that cooperation agreement. And uh, Doc is the only member of BMF who can link the two brothers together in a, in a, in a conspiracy because of his re responsibility of overseeing uh, all of their financial affairs. So when um, Doc Marshall decides to cooperate, uh, there's, there's no wiggle room anymore for, for Terry and, and Demetrius in this case. This is a picture of Demetrius at uh, his arraignment. The case came down in Detroit uh, because most of the activity was going on in Michigan, but Demetrius was living in Atlanta, and that's why a lot of the coverage, even to this day, uh, paints the Black Mafia family story and Demetrius as, a, as an Atlanta tale, uh, when in fact it's, it's a Detroit tale. <laughs> um, the aftermath... Uh, on the eve of trial, Meech and Terry both plead guilty. Uh, I was there when this happened. Um, it was very dramatic. It was supposed to be the first day of jury selection. Um, most every other BMF had, had pleaded guilty. Terry and Demetrius still wanted to take it to trial. I believe Terry, uh, Terry, was, Terry was dead to rights. But Demetrius, I believe, had a chance to beat the case um, it was a very thin case against Demetrius uh, in terms of on paper. 
I mean, Doc Marshall would have got up there and, and said what he said, and, and O-Dog would have got up there and said what he said, but in terms of um, direct evidence, there was very little that tied Demetrius to this operation. So Demetrius very easily could have rolled the dice, and it probably would have been a 50-50 call. He either would have walked free, or he would have done the rest of his life in prison. He decided um, to, plead, to plead guilty. But So it's the, the first day, it's supposed to be uh, the start of the trial, and the defense attorneys go to the judge and they say, judge, I think we'll, we might be able to avoid this trial, not have to, uh, you know, have to pay all the money that the, 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 the taxpayers would have to take out of their pockets to put towards this, this huge trial, which could have gone on for five, six months. Um, I think we can resolve that. I think, they, I think both uh, Flannery brothers will uh, agree to plead not, or will agree to plead guilty but we have one request. We, we request that uh, Terry and Demetrius get to meet face-to-face -face in the back of the courtroom. Um, it was an unusual request, but it was granted. This was before they had pled guilty. And everyone's sitting in the courtroom, and within five minutes, you can just hear screaming erupting from the room that they're in. And you can hear them yelling at each other, like airing of the grievances. You know, it's all on the table. Um, you know, and you can hear the argument. And I'm sitting with some DA and FBI agents and prosecutors, and they're thinking, they're, they're, they're like, this is perfect. Terry's going to flip on Demetrius. We're, you know, they're going to come out of the court, and Terry's going to walk to us and say, I'm going to cut a deal with you. Again, that just misread who these guys were. Um, I think it was probably therapeutic or cathartic in some ways to, to get that all out, uh, get it all out uh, on the table, get it all uh, clear the air. They both came back into the court and they both pled guilty and went their own separate ways. But for about 20 minutes there, uh, the prosecutors thought for sure Terry was about to flip on his brother, but he never did. Uh, upon a number of BMF members beginning to filter out of prison, Meech announces a BMF rebrand. So this was about five or six years ago. Uh, Demetrius has made it clear that he doesn't want BMF uh, to stand for Black Mafia Family anymore. He doesn't want it to be viewed as a drug dealing organization that uh, when he comes out of prison, um, he wants to reinvent BMF. And he has people right now working on his behalf to try to do that and reinvent it as a, a luxury lifestyle brand as well as a, com a community empowerment, uh, social services, giving back to the neighborhood uh, type of uh, organization. In 2016, 50 Cent options the rights to the Flannery Brothers' life story, cuts a deal with the Stars Network to make a scripted television show. And this is the uh, billboard that was put out by Stars and 50 Cent to promote the, uh, the show. If you've been in LA in the last six months, um, there are a number of them very prominently displayed uh, all around Hollywood and Beverly Hills. There's been a lot of money put uh, behind the marketing of, of this show. And then Terry's released from prison in 2020 uh, via sentencing reduction and returns to Detroit, came back in the middle of, uh, of, of the COVID outbreak. And I will tell you that if you were on uh, Terry Flannery's block uh, in May of 2020, well, we were two months you know, removed from the start of the pandemic, um, you would have never been able to tell because him coming back to Detroit uh, was like a head of state returning or a, uh, I mean, it, you had a line out the door for for three or four weeks of people wanting to come in and shake his hand and, and take selfies, uh, and not just neighborhood people. You had LL Cool J, Fabulous, 50 Cent, Puffy Combs. They all came in town to kiss his ring. Uh, 50 actually gave him a coming home present of a Bentley. Um, ironically, he can't drive it because he's on house arrest, but I think it was the, uh, the thought that counts. And Terry right now is working retail uh, at a store in Detroit. Um, it's, it's surreal to go in there and see him. And he's standing behind a counter, checking people in and out uh, 
for, for buying, the, he's working at a clothier, and I, I'm sure that nine out of every 10 people that come in there have no idea who's behind the counter. Uh, BMF show premieres in September of uh, 2021 to smash ratings, and as of right now, Demetrius is not scheduled for release until 2028. Uh, got a four-year reduction. Initially, he was uh, scheduled for release in, in 2032, but... Uh, he got, it, he got four years shaved off it. He thought, or I think a lot of us thought, that last summer he was going to be able to come out um, in the same way that Terry was able to come out. You got to remember, these are nonviolent offenders. Uh, yes, Demetrius might have been a suspect um, in some violence. He, he was let off on one of the, the murders because of a, a, a self-defense, but he is a nonviolent offender, and um, a... a ton of nonviolent offenders were able to come out uh, via the pandemic because judges wanted to uh, lessen the prison population and wanted to get people that they didn't consider dangers to society out to finish their sentences on the outside. So Terry got out 10 years early. Terry and Demetrius are in on the same exact case. Um, Demetrius has a hard time wrapping his brain around the fact that while they're in on the same case and while in the world of the drug game, they're considered equals, in pop culture and in the, in the, in the real world, nobody knows who Southwest T is. Everybody knows who Meech is. So it's the gift and the curse of that notoriety. Uh, outside of Al Capone, John Gotti and Whitey Bulger, I don't think there is a more iconic American criminal uh, of the last 100 years uh, than Big Meech. And un unfortunately for him, that means that he's going to have to do uh, an extra eight years in prison if uh, a judge doesn't agree to reduce his sentence in the next uh, seven, seven years. So that's where we stand today. I, I enjoy giving this talk. I'll be more than willing to take some, some questions. I hope you enjoyed it. Round of applause for uh, Scott Bernstein. Yeah, so we'll, we'll take some questions. If you have, raise your hand if you would, and then Shaquille will come around with her microphone so you can, uh, you can speak into the microphone. Yeah, good evening. Thank you for your talk. Uh, early on, you mentioned that the two brothers started skipping out of their ninth grade classes. Can you tell me, was one of them tested and advanced forward in classes? Because they weren't the same age, right? Well, no, they were two, they were, uh, uh, two years apart in age, but one year apart in school. Um, so in fact, Terry would have been in eighth grade at that point. Um, I don't think Terry ever actually went to a class at Southwest. Ter uh, Demetrius started in ninth grade, but never finished it. Um, if you're from Detroit, Detroit Southwestern High School is known as a basketball mecca. Um, it's a legendary basketball program. Jalen Rose, if you guys are uh, aware of who he is, um, is one of the proud Detroit Southwestern alums. So when they were going there, it was when Jalen Rose was a basketball star. So I, I think they were, they were, uh, they were, you could see them at basketball games, but you couldn't see them at school, is what I'm saying. <laughs> so they were at all the Detroit Southwestern basketball games in 88, 89, uh, but you actually couldn't see them in the halls of, of Detroit Southwestern. High school. Another question. Well, I have one uh, for you, Scott. You, one thing you mentioned to me I think you should talk about is this, the Black Mafia Family TV series is also, they're also producing a docu-series about yeah. this. So uh, the first season of Black Mafia Family scripted show will end on December 14th. Um, I believe it, it runs from 9 to 10 o'clock at night, and then at 10 o'clock, Right after uh, the, credits, the credits run on the scripted show, a docu-series will premiere on the Stars Network that will run for the next eight weeks after that. And it's an eight-part docu-series that will be telling you the real story of Black Mafia Family from the people that lived it. Um, all, a lot of ex-Black Mafia Family members are participating. Demetrius is participating. Hopefully, Terry will, will, will participate. We're still working on that. Um, Jack Harvey, all the DEA and FBI agents that made the case, myself. Um, but there, uh, I'll, I'll give a quick um, 
end note that the brothers had reconciled for a short period of time. Um, when I uh, met Demetrius in 2017, I thought him and his brother were no longer speaking, and I, I said, it's really sad about you and your brother. He said, actually, we're on good terms now. Um, and I was like, oh, that's nice. And they would communicate uh, via, I mean, I'm not, I don't think I'm, I'm spilling secrets here, but they, they would communicate through smuggled cell phones uh, in prison. Um, it's kind of crazy to believe if you're not someone who's incarcerated or you don't know anything about that world, but uh, you can actually pretty easily find access to iPhones and whatnot on the black market in prison. And uh, if the guards aren't paying attention, you can make phone calls. So uh, Demetrius and Terry were communicating um, for a couple years and were on good terms. And then when um, Terry came out of prison in, in May of, of 2020, it all, it, it all fell apart again. And uh, Demetrius felt or feels that Terry is being hypocritical because Terry right now is out living a very flashy lifestyle uh, since he got out of prison. Um, a lot of selfies. I uh, started an Instagram account, I think the day he walked out of prison, um, showing lots of pictures of him doing lots of fun, lavish, expensive things. And Demetrius thinks, and he's probably right, that that is reflecting poorly on him and is probably in some ways, I don't think completely is the reason that Demetrius isn't out, but I think it contributed to the belief of the federal government that if we let you out, you're going to act the same way your brother's acting right now. Um, so Demetrius is kind of like, well, 15 years ago, you're having a fit at my behavior, but now you're acting the exact same way, and it's costing me my, my freedom. That's what Demetrius believes. So now they have not spoken now for the last year and a half, and I, I don't believe they'll, they'll, they'll be speaking anytime soon. <laughs> I think we have one more question. Yeah, it's this, this is on. Um, yeah. So you said you've, talk, you've spoken with Demetrius several times. How did that initially come about? Is it just because he wants more notoriety? Yeah, probably. Uh, he reached out to me. Uh, I had started writing about him probably in like 2010, 11. Um, and I wrote a lot between 2010 and 11 and now. He reached out to me in, in the end of seven, uh, the fall of 2017, so about four years ago. Uh, he said that he enjoyed my reporting, that I was one of the guys that you know, uh, really got, got the story right, and that he wanted to use me in some regard as a conduit to try to get his, some parts of his story out there. Um, you know, he's, he's they, they, they mess with him in there. But that's any celebrity prisoner. The, the, the guards aren't going to like. The warden's not going to like. Maybe the other inmates. Like, I think he lives like a king inside in terms of the other inmates revere him. But uh, they, uh, they do something they call diesel. Again, if you're, if you're not someone familiar with the U.S. Um, Department of Corrections, they do something called diesel therapy when they don't like you. Um, meaning that they will constantly move you from facility to facility. Um, and the moving process is incredibly painful. I mean, you're in shackles, and they put you on a bus, and you don't know when you'll be getting off that bus, and it could take two weeks. Um, and it's, it's, it's quite emotionally and physically taxing. And uh, they've been moving Demetrius around uh, since, the, since COVID, he's, in, he's outside of Portland, and they haven't moved him. But between 17 and 20, they were moving him pretty consistently. So it would be difficult. I would, I'd get a couple months where I had easy access to him, and then there'd be you know, four or five months where I couldn't get access to him because no one knew where he was. I think we have one more question in the back. Uh, yes. Um, you talk about all the, the movie stars and all those other people that were like hanging around. But were they ever politically involved with the government, with the, with the mayor's office? Because at that time, you know, it was the Kwame, because Kwame ended up going to prison for yeah. a long time. And somebody told me one time, they said, when you go to feds, they watch you make the money, they watch you spend the money, 
And by the time you go to court, they got a case because they watched you already. And so I just want to know, were they politically involved? Yeah, that's a, and, but I have one other question. Yeah. Prior to the 90s, so in the 80s, everywhere, I lived in D.C., and like every night, there was so much violence. And you're talking about Detroit or everywhere? Everywhere. Yeah. Because that crack went everywhere. Yeah, it was the Wild West. So who initially brought it in? I understand the, the Mexicans and all that, but I remember living in D.C. at the time, and Oliver North got in trouble for bringing all his cocaine up into this country. So, I mean, it goes deeper with them. And like I said, they probably watched them make the money. And it sounds like they just had a lot of people talking to them. And one day I had a friend and he asked me, he said, Donna, what did the man from the, mouth, from the Godfather say? I'm like, I don't know what he said. And he happened to be from Detroit. And he died that year in 1987. He said, uh, Eddie Wingate? No, I'm not saying who it okay. is. <laughs> and he said, as he walked out my door, he said, forgive me for my language. He said, a man in the Godfather say, give the drugs to the niggas. Yes. Let them kill themselves. And that's all I have to that, say. That was a, a scene from the Godfather. And the, the character that actually made that speech was supposed to be the Detroit Godfather. Uh, the character's name was Joe Zalucci. But he was based on Joe Zerilli. Um, yes, that was a, uh, I believe that was a, a, a common strategy by Italian mobsters of that area, of that era. Um, they would be okay with investing in drug dealing operations, but they, they wouldn't want those operations to be flourishing in, in their neighborhoods. Uh, but let me, I want to answer her first question. Yeah, you want to answer her first question, and I'll touch on the second one. Yeah, uh, I think that that's a very good question, and I should have touched on that. So although we haven't been able to discover any direct uh, links between black mafia family and political officials, there are two pretty substantial uh, tangential links. So with Kwame Kilpatrick, she just referenced, if you're not from Detroit, uh, Kwame Kilpatrick was our mayor uh, for about six years and uh, got convicted of a, a, a racketeering statute. He was using Detroit City Hall basically as a mob organization where he was shaking down every possible uh, you know, a city vendor or, or employee. He was a, his, his people were suspected in a number of murders. Uh, it was a, a very, very dark period in Detroit City Hall, and uh, he was convicted of a racketeering statute and went to prison, well, was sent to prison for 30 years, but Donald Trump actually let him out on a pardon after seven, um, which I have a pretty big issue with. But that's uh, ne neither here nor there. Uh, but Kwame was connected to a group that was known as the PAs, or per uh, Puritan Avenue Crew, and the PAs uh, ran parts of the west side of Detroit. And uh, two, guys two guys specifically, one named Dude and another one named Slim. Uh, Reggie the Dude Danzy and, and Damon Slim Brantley. And Dude and Slim were a subunit of Black Mafia family. And Dude and Slim had a tie-in to Kwame. Uh, and then in terms of, in Atlanta, there was actually a, a, a double murder that occurred uh, within this uh, Sin City enforcement unit, uh, enforcement unit that Black Mafia family had down south. Um, one of the members of that group uh, was known as uh, Tremaine Graham, they called him Kiki, and Kiki Graham was married <laughs> to the mayor of Atlanta's daughter. And while uh, Mayor Franklin was in office, um, Kiki Graham committed a double murder. And there was a lot of connections being made in the press down in Atlanta at that time between Kiki Graham and Black Mafia family. So 
I don't know how much influence they had with the mayor of Atlanta, if any, but the mayor of Atlanta's daughter was married to one of these guys. Just a quick note on your second question. Um, uh, we could do a whole separate program about who supplied crack in America, and there, you know, there's actually a move, uh, there's a, a, a series of investigative reports that were done in California by a reporter there, piecing it together uh, the idea that the CIA had something to do with this, and I think there's there's actually there's something to that, but um, we don't have time tonight to go into all the details of that thing. Go watch so the movie Kill the Messenger. Watch, watch the movie Kill the Messenger, and you'll get a pretty good take on on what that's about. So. Uh, thank you all very much. If you I'll, have a I'll question, you can take one. Yeah, I'll, can I'll come stay up around if people want to come up. And thank you. Thank you.